Welcome to My Vintage Love. I am here today with Lauren Rossi, AKA Virtuous Courtesan, who is one of the most amazing historical couture creators I know certainly, and I know so many of your fans appreciate your work so very much. And she was kind enough to bring two of her dresses that she made herself for both of us to wear during this. And I am honored and so excited to be wearing this dress. I can't even tell you, I'm gonna be sad to take it off. <laughs> and it just adds so much to this tutorial because we're doing an 18th century makeup tutorial today. And to have the dress and the hair and everything, it just helps so much because the 18th century was kind of an extreme time for makeup. So to have everything together, it really, really helps. And thank you so much for being here. Okay. And I am gonna show you right now how to get this amazing 18th century makeup look. Here's Lauren, ready to go, fresh face with no makeup on. The 18th century was a really exciting time for makeup. It was one of those eras when makeup was very accepted. Um, for most of human history, makeup has gone through phases where it's acceptable and then not acceptable. And for the most of the 18th century, it was very acceptable and even expected among aristocracy and the nobility and those classes. And the ideal 18th century makeup would have been very, very pale, very smooth skin, which we see in so many of the portraits from the time, very rouged cheeks. Um, the nobility were expected to wear rouge. It was a sign of status. You could wear it if you were, you know, a lady of quality and things like that, but it was much more subtle. And brows were generally kept pretty natural. Lips were maybe a little bit of color and then patches. So we'll, that was kind of the 18th century face and we'll talk more about those as we go. So I'm gonna get started on Lauren's face. Um, okay, so the first thing and the most important thing was very, very pale skin. Pale skin meant that you were not a peasant. It meant that you were not working, toiling in the fields. As I'm sure you heard, the main ingredient in skin whiteners at the time was lead. And the main product they used was ceruse, C-E-R-U-S-E. -E. And this was a product that was used for centuries, I believe. It was very popular in the, sixth, the 17th century as well, and used very much in Elizabethan ages. And it continued to be popular in the 18th century. And people kind of knew it was poisonous, but would use it anyways. <laughs> Like, and it led to all kinds of horrible things. Um, it led to hair loss. It led to tooth erosion, gum erosion, which led to tooth loss. It, it would make your skin wither and turn gray and yellow. So people would use this and they would look great, but then it would cause their skin to wither and all these horrible things to happen. And then they'd have to use more. So it really became this very vicious cycle. And there was actually stories of women dying, um, very public, you know, public stories. Uh, the Gunning sisters were famous beauties of the time. And um, one of them died at 28 because she had basically ruined herself through the use of cosmetics. And her sister was not as addicted to Ceruse, but still her beauty was ruined by 30, and she, but she died 30 years later. So it was these very, lots of these stories. So it was, people knew it was bad for them, but they would use it anyways. Um, so dying for beauty. Um, so, yeah, that's always interesting to think about, so don't do that. So the product we're gonna use today that is not lead-based and will not kill Lauren is uh, the good oldie MAC Studio Fix in Shivering White. This is a true white powder foundation, and we're gonna go ahead and use this with the IT Cosmetics brush and just create this beautiful white, lovely skin. They had, Cirrus came in powder and paste from what I could from what I could find in my research. And it's so funny to think about how obsessed they were with pale skin back in the day because so much of what we're obsessed with nowadays is, is being tan, which really tan didn't become a, a goal for women until, gosh, I would say the 20s or 30s when Coco Chanel made it famous and enviable. But before then, for centuries, centuries and centuries, it was all about having beautiful, gorgeous white skin. Pale skin, I should say. It was really all about appearance, it's especially at the level of nobility, Marie Antoinette, all of those people that we know the names of. It was all about the appearance of power and the proximity to the king and getting noticed by the king. I read a, a a few passages talking about how it really wasn't, in Maria Antoinette's case in particular, but in I think for most nobility, it really wasn't about beautifying, it was about 
it was about the appearance of letting people know that you were powerful and letting people know that you were part of an upper class, the upper class. This is going to look, this makeup looks very jarring to a modern eye. Um, obviously this is not the makeup that we would do every day to ourselves. Um, turn a little bit this way for me, thank you. But with the hair powdered and up and the dresses on, you can really see what the final product would have been taken out of context with in modern clothing and modern dress, it would be quite odd and quite jarring. But I feel like with this, with everything, Lauren's been so kind to let us wear her amazing dresses. It really, it really makes sense, I think. So Lauren, I know that you go to a lot of events where you get to wear your beautiful creations. And do you, do you tend to do period correct makeup? I don't consider myself to be a reenactor, so okay. I tend to wear makeup that um, might be a little bit more pleasing to a modern, contemporary eye. Sure. Um, but I do occasionally do the hair powders and yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's, when you do, not necessarily reenact, but you wear the clothing and the hair and everything, there's that kind of push-pull between what was considered what was appropriate back then or what right. was period period correct versus what is pleasant to the modern eye. So I think that's kind of a kind of a back and forth sometimes. Because I know that if I if and when I get to go to a party wearing one of these, I will definitely be tweaking my makeup slightly. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing that's that pale skin denotes is um or clear skin I should say, pale and clear skin is um good health. And that was, you know, not as guaranteed as it is today because there's more pests and people died earlier and there was more disease that was harder to to cure so it was definitely a sign of you know I'm healthy you look at me so you can see I'm bringing this down to Lauren's neck and chest this would have been a part of it as with today's foundation you don't want to create the floating head effect and this would very much create a floating head effect so you really want to bring this same color down to the chest so everything will appear white and smooth and lovely. And as I mentioned, they had they used powder and paste for Ceruse back then, is my understanding. And if you wanted to use a paste form, um, MAC also makes uh, a pure a paint stick in pure white if you want to go that route. Um, when I was testing it on myself, I kind of liked the effect of the powder better, which is why I decided to go with the Shivering White Fix Plus. But if you do want to go the, the paint stick route or the, the paint route, you can go ahead and use the pure white. Just an option. I think if you're going for true longevity, you might want to do the paint stick and then do the powder over it, but well, we're not worried about longevity today. <laughs> so if you, it's good to have a slightly smaller brush, a concealer brush or an eyeshadow brush to kind of get in around the eyes and kind of smooth that out. Something else I read as well is that the more formal the event, the paler the skin would be and the brighter the rouge would be. So on an everyday basis, it might be just a little wash of powder, but for very fancy events, very important events, they would really go for the makeup. The men and the women um, definitely was very acceptable at this time for men to wear makeup. Certainly in the French and somewhat the British court as well. But it was all about showing off and showing the wealth. Of course, a very formal event is more likely to be in the evening with mm -hmm. candlelight. Yes. So yes. You, need, you need more to, for it to yeah, show up. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly to your point. Like, everyone looks better by candlelight. It doesn't matter <laughs> what you're wearing or what makeup. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine that in the daytime, this would be a very harsh right. look. But by candlelight, and nothing but candlelight, because they didn't have electricity back then, it would have been quite lovely, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I think I did read someone saying that, you know, in the British court, like, all the ladies have white skin and dark brows and very rouged cheeks and lips. And by candlelight, it looks great. <laughs> Maybe not so much during the day. Um, okay, so I feel good about our opaqueness and our whiteness of Lauren. I think she's working lovely. And the next thing is rouge. And rouge was very important. It was, again, a sign of status. Uh, you were not allowed, I'm sorry, you were allowed to wear it if you were non-aristocratic or non-noble, but you would have worn much, much less of it. So you basically, it was like, if you were an aristocrat or a noble, you could wear a lot of rouge. If you were a lady of quality, so like, you know, 
kind of middle class, I guess, back in the day. You we, you could only wear a little bit, and if you were a hooker or a courtesan, you could wear a lot. So it was like there's these varying degrees of what was allowed according to your social status, basically. Um, and there were different colors. Uh, there was depending on what it was made. It was animal based or mineral based or vegetable based. There was red reds, blue based reds, oranges. There were pinks, which I thought was really interesting to find out. There was an account by a count of going to a aristocratic lady's toilet and seeing her have like you know six different colors of rouge on her on her di or dressing table, which I thought was really interesting because I like, I was kind of thought it was just like yeah, one color, I but realize that either. yeah, yeah cool. I, there was there were you know more <laughs> options than I thought there were, which was really cool. Um, so they had, my understanding is they had it in powder and a cream paste form. This is the Besame Crimson, so it's quite bright, um, but it was all about the bright cheeks back then. So we're going to go in there. I believe, Be I believe Besame still makes this. I believe it is in different packaging, but this is a great, like, let's just go for it kind of blush. So I'm just putting a little on the brush and then putting a little on the back of my hand, kind of working it in. And we're not going for subtlety here. <laughs> Um, the thing I liked about the placement too was I feel like it was really, in the end it was meant to mimic a true flush of the skin, so like what would happen if you blushed when you got embarrassed or something, which tends to happen more here. Um, and so it's less of like on the apples of the cheeks and it's more kind of spread down this way. If you look at the pictures you see that quite often, which I think is such a pretty, pretty look. So I'm starting the color on the apples, but then I'm kind of bringing it a little bit lower. And this blush, a little goes a long way. I think if you're gonna do this, go ahead and really go in with a bright blush. Don't, don't try and be subtle about it. But because this is a naturally, clearly a bright blush, and we're putting it on white skin, powdered white skin, it's gonna show up quite a lot. And, bl and brush, sorry. And rouge was also something that was worn brighter for more special occasions. And depending on what it was made out of, it could also be quite poisonous. There, were, there was lead-based rouge as well. But go ahead, if you're doing this look, really go ahead and just go in with a bright blush. Don't be afraid to go for it. You can always build up. And you can use a powder blush or a cream blush. The cons consistency of this is nice and on the drier side for a cream. So it's working quite well. And I read, at the time, it was very common for the aristocratic or nobility ladies to take all day to get ready, apparently. This was like an all-day thing. They would invite their friends over and talk about politics and things like that and not just, you know, like really important stuff. So I, I love that idea of like, yeah, let's, it's very modern, that idea of like, let's come over and hang out as we get ready and talk about everything. It would have been a great way to learn about what's happening in the world, right? Yeah, exactly. So you get kind of the, it all comes together and we have getting news and Absolutely. important updates and you, know, yeah. you can't just get a text message. So. Right, pre-text message <laughs> yeah. days. Yeah, you're, you're getting your news and your gossip from your girlfriends, hanging out, doing your thing. And I read that from Rie Antoinette's toilet was very, it was a great honor to attend, but the high point of the toilet was, have, was watching her blush be put on. That was the the moment you wanted to be there. Um, okay, so next we're gonna move on to brows. Brows were generally pretty natural. There was a time, I think, near the end of the 1700s when the, the heavier brow, the quite like a black, dark brow became quite popular, which really set off against the whiteness of the skin. Um, but for the vast majority of the 1700s, it looked like it was more of just a natural brow. The thing was, when women and men were using ceruse and lead-based cosmetics, part of the things that would happen was hair loss. Their hair would fall out, which includes eyebrows. So one of the most interesting things I read in my, re my research was that they were sold mouse fur pelts to glue to their, their where their eyebrows used to be with mastic gum. And this is such a kick to me. And there was all these, these poets that would make fun of them uh, for using these things. And there was a great poem. It was written in 1718. I'll see if I can remember it. And it was... A little things as, oh shoot, what is it? Ah, I had it. Um, oh, on little things as sages write, depends our joy or sorrow. If we don't catch a mouse tonight, alas, no eyebrows for tomorrow. 
<laughs> Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. It's so catty. It's just, like, so just captures it so well. I love it. Um, so we're not going to put a mouse pelt on Lori today. <laughs> Thank you for the no lead and the no mouse. Yeah. <laughs> that was my favorite bit of research, mm -hmm. this entire thing. Um, so I'm just brushing through Lauren's eyebrows, really just to get out that white powder that we were using. So I'm just gonna put a little bit of brow gel on Lauren's brows. This is a Chanel taupe brow gel, just to give a little more something. No black brows, no mouse hides. What they would have used if they wanted to create a darker brow, they could use elderberry juice, they would, or burnt cork. Burnt cork or something else. So something, something along those lines would have darkened up the brows at the time. So the last step, <laughs> actually second to last step, sorry, <laughs> is the lips. Um, the lips were rosy, dewy. You see that a lot in the photo, in the paintings at the time. It's just you know those lovely dewy, moist lips. Um, they did have colored pomades, pomades at the time, um, or they would put a little bit of rouge on their lips as well, leftover rouge. I do have this lovely. This is by Julie Hewitt. This is. Um, Camila Ruby Lip Balm, really beautiful color, very, very natural, very, just creates the perfect lip tone for this. I'm just gonna go in there. So this is just gonna give us a tiny bit of color. Yeah, I'm just following the natural lip shape, no major drawing over of the lips, drawing under the lips, nothing like that. It's really just to give a little a little color to the lips, a little, you know, sensuality to the mouth, I think. Yeah, obviously no eye makeup at all. No mascara, no liner, nothing like that. I, it's, it's not evident in, in paintings and it's not, it was, I didn't see any reference to it at all in any of my research. Um, it was all about skincare, basically. Um, Ceruse, rouge, and Patches <laughs> is the last thing we're going to put on. This um, patches were around for a very long time. They were made originally to cover, well, they were always used to cover um, blemishes and pockmarks and smallpox uh, scars. scars and things like that. And um, they could, there was, you know, the ever popular uh, circle, there was stars, um, crescent moons, things like that. I think when they got really out of hand, there was like a horse-drawn horse -drawn carriage and things like that, which were, you know, way over the top kind of stuff. Um, and they were actually, they were actually used um, to denote um, political affiliation more, I think, I think maybe more in England, but maybe in France as well. But I think it was the, the Tories on the left and the Whigs on the right. And if you were supported or you were neutral, you could do, you could um, patch on both sides. Uh, the, or if you were, was it the gallant was near the eyes or one on the cheek meant something else, one near the mouth meant something else. So it was this whole like code of how to use your patches. And um, I, one of my favorite things I read about patching was there was a, something from a, a letter written to another man at the time who said he had heard about a prenup being drawn up where basically the woman had stipulated that she gets to patch however she wants, no matter what her husband says. So I thought that was very funny. Um, it's, it's really interesting doing the research because when you, you find these like little tidbits of things that people were writing about and thinking about and you're like, oh, wow, I guess they weren't that different from us, no, but they were. Don't yeah, I mean, they don't really change. They, yeah. they're, they're always doing the same thing at the end of the day. So this is from Millie Makeup, M-I-L-Y Makeup. I found these, they're amazing, especially if you're doing this kind of look or for every day. Uh, they have all kinds of great shapes and sizes and I think they're just really, really fun. And really, if you're gonna do 1800s, I mean, sorry, 1700s, 18th century makeup, you need a patch. I think they kind of tended to fall out a little bit of fashion near the end of the century, but um, they were quite popular for a very long time. But can you imagine, like, I kind of wish they'd come back in style, because if I have a big zit, like, nothing would make me happier than just being like, just a patch, put a patch on that today. Like, how convenient is that? So do you have a, do you have a preference? I love what you stars. Do? You love stars, okay. Yeah. Well, let's go for a big star then. They're a little tricky to get off. But they do stay really well once you get them on, which is really nice. So we're just going to put a little star about here, Lauren's high point, Lauren's cheek there. So lovely. Should we do a second one, or are you feeling yeah. good? Yeah. Okay, let's do let's, it. Let's do it. Since we're here, yeah. 
a heart or another star? A dot. Or a a dot. Okay. A dot. Let's go with a dot. And they did come in black and red um, back in the day. And they were definitely one of those things, as with the fake, as with the fake uh, mouse eyebrows that were very much made fun of at the time. Now, were, were they, they also made of mouse? They, these were not made out of, um, <laughs> of, of mouse hair. <laughs> um, they were made out of fabric satin, I believe, or very nice um, Spanish leather is what, I, is what I read as well. But I, I, there was another little thing I read about, you know, the woman wearing the, the horse-drawn carriage patch and the guy thinking, like, what is she hiding under that? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine. Where should we put this one? The corner of the mouth, you think? Sure. Or? So we're going to put the second one over here. Lovely. I love it. So this is our 18th century finished beauty look, and I think you look amazing. <laughs> I'm so glad that you came and you brought these amazing dresses, and it looks so amazing just Thanks. all together. Thank you. This was so much fun. I'm so glad you had a good time, <laughs> and I really enjoyed doing this. This was a lot of fun to research and find out more about, and especially such a treat to do the makeup on you, Lauren, with the hair and the dresses and everything, and she even brought one for me to wear, and I'm so happy. <laughs> um, so thank you again for joining us. It was a real treat. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I enjoyed bringing it to you. Please subscribe below if you haven't already and follow us on Instagram at My Vintage Love Blog and follow Lauren at Virtuous Courtesan on Instagram as well for all of her amazing content. Thank you so much and we'll see you at the next one.